Uh, we'll move on to the next pre presenter. This is uh, Steve Meyer. He's the data strategist for the U U University of Washington Madison Libraries. Wisconsin, I'm sorry, that's full pot here. Uh, University of Wisconsin Madison Libraries. His work includes the development of policies for the use of data, data reporting, analytics, and visualizations, and experimental projects such as the one that will be showcased in today's presentation to explore new possibilities for using data in discovery systems. His presentation is entitled a Bibliographic Data Crawl to Enhance Library Discovery with Linked Data. Please welcome Steve. Data is variable. 
you're increasing the number of HTTP requests that you actually have to make. And that matters in a web application um, context. Um, if Picasso, for example, has an influence network of 54 people, that's potentially 54 HTTP requests that would have to be made just to get the display names um, that you actually want to render. On the other hand, if I use a Sparkle query, um, it enables me to send one request. Um, it's a little slower, but then I can um, get all the data I need um, right away. The trade-off, of course, is complexity. Um, I and that's you know the, the Sparkle itself is not too complex, but what we do end up finding is that you do then need to write a custom parser for each response that comes back. Um, we felt that it justified the complexity to just meet the speed expectations from a, for a web application context. Um, there's one other plug that I would give for um, the technical side of working with linked data. If you write computer code and you're sort of um, <clears throat> working with a web application, you use an object relational mapper these days. And this is a code framework that allows you to say, I'm going to work in my problem domain. I'm going to leave the stuff like writing SQL statements off to a code framework. Um, everybody does this. Um, it, makes our, it makes our life as programmers much more um, reasonable. So just as I don't want to write SQL code in a web, in a web application framework, I also don't want to do the kind of lower level paradigms of parsing or querying a graph in memory. Um, if you've ever worked with the Ruby RDF libraries, there's one great little gem that might not be as well known called Spira, and it acts as an object RDF mapper so that you can write your code in a more um, object-oriented way, and that's a major help in this kind of and when doing this kind of work. We need more tools that are sort of mature like this. So as we move into a world of linked data, um, we just, why did we do it? We really just wanted to remember to not forget about the links. Um, uh, I had uh, my example earlier was supposed to be a sort of a Gertrude Stein um, knowledge card, and so using that as a theme, a link is a link is a link. Um, we wrote up a, um, a position paper, a rough kind of position paper of sorts that explains our thinking here that you can take a look at. But ultimately, it comes to this um, quote from the original design document um, by Tim Berners-Lee. When you have linked data, you can find other related data. Um, so a few examples actually work really well. The, um, the in defense of food example that I had up earlier, um, if you look at the film appearances, we have we have um, a lot of those documentaries in our collection. That provides context and extra links for people to sort of broadcast. And that's data that's not in our catalog, catalog records itself. Um, you know, the other thing that I, that I find interesting is that for Bertrand, or, excuse me, for Picasso, his notable works are his, are his paintings. Getting access to that, our catalog will respond to a search of for Guernica. It also works for, you know, when the notable works as software. Things we don't collect, but we do have, they will match subject headings. Um, there's more data in the world um, that's relevant to our, our patrons' information seekings than what we have alone. Um, and this is a common theme that pops up again and again in libraries. We should reorient ourselves towards our patrons rather than expect our patrons to orient their information seeking um, behaviors to <coughs> our institutions. So I believe this phrase, um, the library in the life of the user, um, was coined back in 1973 by Douglas Swarzig um, in the work he did for his dissertation. And so that's really what our, our inspiration is here. Our work with knowledge cards is intended to serve in a similar vein. Um, uh, we want to sort of focus on the full context of the creators of these works that are in our collections. So let's shift gears for a moment and um, talk about the impact this has had on our services. Um, first, some of the sort of critical review by my library colleagues. Um, now, consider that consistency and dependability um, are a core aspect of an IT feature that enables the user of that feature to learn how it works um, and assess its value to his or her work. Um, for these knowledge cards, the consistency and dependability of that data would be that um, would be the data elements encountered for one person will be appropriately applied to subsequent identities that are encountered. Um, the Stein or Picasso examples that I often use exhibit what we might call a well-formed knowledge card. 
where it should be, where, um, where data is where it should be, it's complete enough, and it serves to illustrate the kinds of things that I could learn when looking at other identities. So um, one of the review sessions that I had by some of my colleagues was, uh, it was right before Easter weekend, so we, um, someone said, find a subject heading where Jesus um, is, is authority control. Um, and so we, looked, we took a look at this. The notable works are a little um, funny compared to the other examples, and it's sort of, it's a little bit strange to think that Jesus was an influence on only one person. <laughs> um, when the head of our art library took a look at the Picasso card, she was puzzled by the notable works. Um, the, you know, for example, the, the inclusion of the massacre in Korea over, say, any of Picasso's blue period works. Um, and so what this, what this sort of says is that for a librarian with training in evaluating information, it really does um, screen out that we need more attribution for these assertions. Um, so I'm getting very short on time. This um, blog post really informed a lot of our thinking also. Um, you see things like this. These were retrieved just a few days ago. Current president, candidate. Well, while it may be sort of wishful thinking, um, that has an impact and it butts up against what our what we teach in our information literacy sections. Um, but in cases that are, have more impact, we find that um, we used to pull um, images. This was the image that was pulled for Chelsea Manning. Um, one of the things that sort of using an image like this, uh, Rizro also sort of characterized that. There's some in instance used to do the same same thing and pull it and use the display name Bradley Manning. Um, and not only is this sort of art, he, he wrote, not only is this out of date, but the act of dead naming a transgender person is to deny their actual identity. And so really, we work hard um, to be conscientious about selection of our descriptive practices and be inclusive. Of, um, but as a result, using data in this manner feels like we might be taking a step backwards. Um, more, more, more examples of sort of lackluster content that you could look back um, in the slides. Um, there is some positive feedback. People do want this feature to work well. Um, we also did get it in front of our uh, user testing sessions. Um, people sort of understood the feature right away. They understood kind of what we were trying to do. Um, one of the sort of surprising things is that they said this is useful enough that I, that you should put it in a more prominent place on the page. Um, so they, note, they noted that I'm going to do this anyway. So the convenience is sort of um, value here. We also saw that they did, they were thinking um, critically about the information. And so that was actually a sort of surprise win for our information literacy um, teaching. Um, so in general, from this sort of patron assessment, you know, they found it, it was not expected, but they did find it useful. Um, they did focus, as a lot of our library staff did, also on the biographical content. This may be in part due to the sort of discussion format of the um, session that we held, um, but we didn't get a lot of um, people noting that they would sort of click the links and go back into um, to go back into our catalog. So I want to wrap up with sort of a brief example that illustrates some of the other problems that we've seen. After sort of looking at this data so much, you go to DBpedia really often, and sometimes it can feel like DBpedia was um, built by an AI that got its first exposure to caffeine. <laughs> it did an all-nighter. It was great, it was highly productive, but it ended up producing a paper like I did when I did the same thing that ended up with extreme amounts of bad grammar. Um, consider this sort of syllogism, this argument of syllogism that's in DBpedia, but between this slide and the next one, I'll show you. Um, this is a reasonable subject assignment. You know, in library land, we would say, yeah, um, love stories is a, is a good subject heading for Romeo and Juliet. Um, but that property, that um, <laughs> DC terms property, is also applied to people. Um, and so, you know, I would sit here and say, oh, you know, really the problem here is that uh, 1946 births, sure, that's a, that's a good thing to know, but that should be that should be set theory. It should be member of. David Lynch is a member of the set of people born in that year, um, and that and that would make sense. Now I'm sort of picking on this one actually just because 
as I'm, I'm coming to this from the perspective of someone who's really trying to use this data um, downstream from the cataloging process, downstream from the sort of descriptive community cataloging processes. But when I encounter too much like this, I'm going to write this property off, even if there's also a lot of good data there. That has an impact on, eventually it's going to degrade from the value of the service. And if the data set keeps doing this to me too much, I'm going to need the evaluation. I can't use that data set because it's going to be a value deficit rather than a value add while trying to enhance the discovery experience for my patrons. So um, I'm happy to talk sort of more about the technical challenges that we encountered or some of the other sort of dive into some of the other comments that, that our library staff had when evaluating this. I think really we do think this is a good idea and everybody wants it to work. But we should have some discussions about the quality of the data that we're encountering, the values that are sort of unexpected when we sort of take a leap and go out and fetch this data that we don't curate ourselves. Are there things like a, a world cat equivalent to this knowledge card data where librarians could have quicker access to uh, finishing things? So thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. We have a few minutes uh, for Q&A for Steve's presentation. Hi, Steve. I'm um, Jean Gotti from OCLC. So, so your comments are very interesting, and I'd like to um, relate to relate them to what we heard at a conference a couple of months ago that was that brought together a multidisciplinary group of outstanding web researchers. And, and so there were a lot of um, medical research, biomedical researchers there using semantic technologies to integrate data. And they, and they made the same points that you're making. That yes, that data is out there, but you can't really use it in its raw form. And so they, they pointed out that, for example, the current version of the LOD cloud shows a lot of biomedical stuff out there. But they made the comment that that shows that it's theoretically interoperable, but if you really want a usable system, you have to do a lot of um, massaging the data to, to make it work. Yeah, so I, I think that, that's a great comment. I think that there's a, a very um, there's a very interesting sort of next step for us or for the library community in general to think about what's the role of the cataloger in this um, algorithmic cataloging. Um, I can sort of imagine that we would say we would we would give the opportunity through some sort of interface tools and whatnot to catalogers to say I'm um, they're going to curate what the algorithm does say they're going to make some selection decisions on which data sets to target and which specific properties from those data sets to target um, that's sort of like just the bare bones um, portion of this and then figuring out ways that we could sort of add more sophistication or you know, start doing a little bit more of the machine learning to build in that, that level of trust. But I think there is a sort of push and pull or a sort of tension between should we be working from a walled off data set that we're comfortable with or do we sort of, do we work in this area that's a little more open ended and take advantage of the vastness of information that's out there. Uh, Tom Kramer from Stanford University. So building on that last point, it sounds like you're thinking about algorithmic cataloging. Um, have you also had discussions moving upstream about either changing uh, the nature of the data in the catalog, what's recorded, or changing the external sources from what you're pulling? Closing the loop. Um, we have not yet had uh, conversations about changing the data in the catalog. Um, we're, our, we're sort of, our institution is probably being a little more conservative with the wait and see. We're keeping, we're keeping an eye on sort of the LD for P initiatives at BibFrame and stuff like that, but we're not actively looking at that. Um, what was the second half again? Or, or changing the data upstream in external sources. Yeah, so we are thinking about that. So the, the part of what we, what we made a decision to do, which is to sort of force the issue by pushing this into our production catalog, was to get especially our bibliographers and our selectors exposure to it and sort of try to explain how does it work, show them the sort of full DBpedia, Wikidata, Getty records, and say, what, else, what are the other data points that you think, what should we be pulling instead? 
you know, and then say maybe let's actually go and look at VIAF and look at the entire realm of data sets that we could, that we could pull from. Um, so part of what we're doing is also trying to engage our own library staff to think about this. Ruth Tillman, um, I guess I have a sort of a question and a challenge, not necessarily to you because it's sort of building off of some of the Q&A I had after Buddha's presentation, because um, I've been thinking since you met Rich and Matt's post and I worked with him on some of those queries, um, one of the issues we found, you know, is if you have an LC authority, you can build a simple knowledge card, but I just, I've got on the phone here uh, the LC authority for Chaz Bono, who is listed as having the genders females, males, and transgender people, and transgender man. Um, and his area of, uh, of activity, I believe, is simply listed as, I'm sorry, it's hard to read id.lmc.com on your phone, uh, but I believe it's um, transgender activism, whereas on DBpedia, um, he's pretty much generally listed as, you know, um, male actors from Los Angeles, male memoirists, um, and the description of him is he's an advocate, writer, musician, and actor. So in that case, that would be actually a much better quality record to pull in than what we have in our own systems because you know, those biases that the catalogers use when trying to say, well, we need to record every single thing that has ever been true about Chaz Bono that we think has ever been true. And so I think, uh, I guess, how would you negotiate that kind of thing where we're dealing with issues in our own systems. Do we, do we spur something to reconcile those? Do we say, look, we're pulling in bad stuff, but we're also putting some stuff in our own systems when we're showing it to people? How do yeah. we so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have a, a, a good answer for how we would reconcile that. I, I just have to be honest about that. Um, our, our library is also um, doing a critical cataloging assessment of some of the biases and LCSH and other parts of our catalog. So th these two things are sort of informing each other. Um, I think that, the, I mean, there's a major problem here that we probably also need to have a conversation about the agency for the authors or the people or the subjects that we're describing. Um, we, we, we looked up a lot of records, especially um, people who have been in, put in jail by the FBI. Um, I think one of the examples was Leonard Peltier. It's a, it's a record that says this person did this bad thing and is now in jail. That's kind of the, what the brief bio says. And it doesn't provide the kind of context that a librarian would be training a student to look for, such as uh, what was he fighting for? What was the FBI doing on the land? Why, where, what is the source of this conflict? What, you know, so there, there's, that's the part where I was trying to sort of glibly say knowledge acquisition right, might be a little bit too tall of a task for just a single little widget. Um, again, it's convenient, but these are the things that we we're, we're struggling with figuring out. How do we contextualize them? I don't have a well-formed question here, but I'm just as I'm hearing all this, I think about the the, the term um, the perfect being the enemy of the good and just trying to balance that with the experimentation that allows us to think through the proper solutions through trial and error. And I, I wonder, is there perhaps a palatable way to put things in front of our users with some kind of caveat that says, you know, we're trying here, let us know when we fail? Because the scale of our data is such that even if we redirected all of our cataloger effort to assessment and evaluation, we would never really see everything. Um, but there are likely to be examples that it will be offensive and that people will be harmed emotionally by or injured and you know, take offense, whatever scale of, uh, of that. So just a comment, I guess. And, Happy to have any other comments and response from the room. Yeah, so we also did, at the time that we launched the feature, um, we knew that we were very likely, just because of the recent controversies around Wikipedia content, that we would have to be prepared to deal with this. We talked to our, we talked to our bibliographers and collection managers about, is there any precedent in the way that we collect controversial content 
for historical purpose, for historical study, that can actually help inform us here. Um, and just saying, we, you know, we, we do have this, we also have a role that we need to not censor our collections so much so that we, we limit the ability for historians in the future to sort of study these things. We're looking, we're looking to those areas and we're looking to the practices that libraries have always done traditionally to, to get at some of these issues. So it seems like most of the examples that you've shown so far have been focused on people. Have you looked at other types of entities and looking? Um, no, we haven't. So we are explicitly listening to this. Um, we're, we're limiting this to 100, 110s, 700, 710s, and 610s, I think. So we are, we are focused on that, partially because we, we did make a decision. We don't want to, we're not prepared staffing-wise to deal with what happens when we get into subject headings and data that we don't control as much. The next thing, though, that a lot of our bibliographers have requested right away, though, is geography, so that we tackle that. Because I think that especially we have a very strong um, international and area studies program, and we want to make sure that we could support that. I did, I did want to say I appreciated in your presentation that you talked about Right, each one said where it was from, and if they were sometimes from different ones. And so I do wonder, maybe following on to your question, if one could both have an a thing to flag it, right? So like a flag error, and that goes to cataloging, but also you know, and like how to fix this yourself, and you know, some sort of little helper page that gives them intros and where they can get info from libraries about you know how you can contribute to the data or something. Like that. Yeah, and that's one thing we do struggle with because we know that so. Um, someone can go and update the Wikipedia entry and have it reflect in real time or even near real time or a week or something in our catalog records. Um, because we're pulling from DBpedia, which is, I think we've looked into as an annual cache, but it's obviously more out of date than that, given the sort of presidential data that we sort of showed earlier. But we do, I mean, we're also just trying to basically cite the sources as good practice to um, give some little shout out to these people, to the institutions and 